The epistle appointed for this second mass on Christmas Day is taken from St. Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. Beloved, when the goodness and kindness of God our Savior appeared, not by reason of good works that we did ourselves, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the bath of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Ghost whom he has abundantly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior, in order that, justified by his grace, we may be heirs in the hope of life everlasting in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. is a continuation of St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 15 to 20. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, the shepherds were saying to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen, they understood what had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard marveled at the things told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept in mind all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, even as it was spoken to them. These are the words of today's Holy Gospel. So it being Sunday, there are some announcements. This is the octave of Christmas. Tomorrow we have the feast of the very first martyr of the church, St. Stephen, stoned to death by the Jews because of his love for and preaching of Jesus Christ. On Tuesday we have the feast of St. John, the great evangelist and the apostle whom he says Jesus loved. On Wednesday is the Holy Innocents. All of those little children that were murdered by the wicked King Herod when he was on a rampage to try to find the King of the Jews that he thought might replace him. So since he couldn't find him, he decided just kill them all. On Thursday, we have St. Thomas of Becket, also a martyr. He was killed by the king for defending the rights of the church. And then we have another king that day who makes up for the wicked king who killed St. Thomas, and that's St. David, the prophet, the royal prophet. And then on Friday at 11 a.m., we have the nuptial mass for Alan Christopher Bitzer and Rose Marie Tony. I'm very happy for my brother to have found a wife. She's a mail order bride from Pakistan that he was able to locate. She doesn't speak English very well. If you speak very slowly to her, she's learning. On Saturday is the feast of St. Catherine Labouret and Pope St. Sylvester I. And then next Sunday is the first of the year, the feast of the circumcision of our Lord. We'll be back to the regular Sunday schedule for that day. If you start today to begin the novena to the Holy name of Jesus, whose feast day is next Monday, January 2nd, then you'll end on that day. Actually, to be more traditional, we would have started it yesterday, 
but we didn't have mass here yesterday like we do today to announce it. But you'll still be able to end on the Feast of the Holy Name if you start the Novena today. Those men who have the rosary this week are from Our Lady of Fatima group. So today is Brian Simpson, Charles Muller tomorrow, Garrett Jarbo on Tuesday, David Jarbo on Wednesday, Matthew Gelhausen has Thursday, uh, Jacob Oaks on Friday, and Matthew Jarbo on Saturday. There's a stocking for donations for the Christmas flowers that we've used for this for the chapel and those are placed on the chapel doors if you have anything that you can put into the stockings that would help out and I guess I really should have started off with saying Merry Christmas to everybody so I'll do that right now Merry Christmas I hope that you have your best Christmas, your holiest Christmas, your merriest Christmas, and an excellent New Year 2017. And I pray that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, this most special of all families, the greatest family in the history of the world, the greatest family that will ever be outside of the family of the most blessed Trinity in eternity, I hope that these three will fortify us in the year to come, and may give us, if they find worthy us worthy of it, a little bit of the peace that they experienced on that first silent night. Thanks to the choir and to the servers, for all of the decorators and the chapel cleaners, for making the chapel, again, like every year, uh, most fitting for these great feast days. It is a, an unwritten tradition in the church. I haven't researched it, but I've heard it for many, many years. That Christmas Day is the day when the majority of the souls of purgatory are released from their prison. And so, to help contribute to as many of the poor souls that are languishing there, all of my masses the three Masses today are for the poor souls. In particular here at Our Lady of the Pillar, all the faithful departed from our chapel. The next announcement, and it is a great announcement, is the First Holy Communion that we have of six people. We have three children, scattered around a little bit. I have to keep looking to find them. And we have three other ones who are not children, but they are young at heart. Today we have Claire Bilodeau, Lucas Fols, and Juliet Brindle. Congratulations to you children, to you families. And those who are Older but young of heart, Cynthia Rommel, Zachary Parker, and Rose Tony from Pakistan. There's a little reception for them afterwards. It's a little sheet cake that my favorite sister Amy made for them. It's not going to be a lot for everybody down there, but it is a First Holy Communion cake, and so everybody is invited to go down. You probably won't get hardly anything, but it's mostly for these children and for the adults. I'm also very happy to announce, and I put it in the bottom of the bulletin, that Cynthia, Zachary, and Rose from Pakistan all came into the church on this past Friday. They were baptized conditionally, and they made their first confessions. So I want to welcome you into the household of the faith, you three, one, two, and three. And 
for all of you six. Today will be the very first full participation of your Mass. Unless you go to Holy Communion, your participation in the Holy Sacrifice is not complete. And so this is also another special day for you. A Mass in every single way. A Mass for you. If you will, show a little bit of charity and patience immediately after the last gospel. These six will come forward to the communion rail and I will enroll them in the brown scapular. And if you could just wait a little bit uh, before leaving. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The feast of Christmas that we are celebrating today started on the greatest day in the history of the world. That's March 25th. Nine months earlier, when Our Lady, after contemplating the Archangel Gabriel's announcement to her that she was to be the Mother of God, she bowed her head and replied, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be it un, unto me according to thy word. At that moment, with those words, with that bowed head, she conceived of the Holy Ghost and became the Virgin Mother of God. At that moment, at that instant, the soul of Jesus, which was always united to the second person of the Blessed Trinity, now began to live a new life, beneath her heart. This life was enclosed in Mary and filled her soul with a divine radiance. She became the temple of God. She became the gate of heaven because if we want to come to Jesus, we have to go to her. She is the gate through which we must pass. She is the gate through which he came to us. She also became the house of gold. In reflecting on these three titles, two of them per pertain particularly to the six of you. Because today at your first Holy Communion, you will become actually physically the temple of God. By baptism, sanctifying grace made you the temple of the Holy Ghost. But now you are going to be raised to a higher level, a physical contact of God, your first taste of God. You will become a physical temple of God. And to add the other title, you will become a house of gold. Our Lady was full of strength and joy. And we think that you will be too with your first Holy Communion. God drew Our Lady into his confidence. He shared his thoughts with her, his plans, his mission with her, and he threw open to her virginal gaze, the most profound and sublime perspectives. So that not only did these two look very much alike, after all, her divine son did not have a human father, but they thought alike and they prayed alike. And never were two persons more alike than Jesus and Mary. You can't argue with that. Everything that I said is absolutely certain. Why then do so many of the non-Catholics like to denigrate Our Lady and say she was just an ordinary woman? She was nothing special. God just told, chose her. He could have chosen anybody. But he didn't. And look at her qualities. Full of grace. She is not ordinary. This is the son, the eternal son of the father. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is my son. On this day you are born. Those are the words of God the father. The only other person in the world that could ever say that, along with God the Father, is our Blessed Mother. 
His words can be her words. She's not ordinary. About Mary, you can never say enough. Above Mary, only God. But below Mary, everything that is not God. That's how unique she is. And no one can ever take that place. And no one will ever take it away from her. On this Christmas morning, I'd like you to consider a mother and child. Every mother delights to feast her eyes upon her child. She likes to meditate untiringly the inexhaustible wonder of her motherhood, to dream and plan the future of the precious being whom she has had the happiness of bringing into this life. The love that thrills her heart is so close to worship that we might almost call it adoration. It's almost an idolatry, but it is, I think, an excusable idolatry, an excusable extension of the term. I know that some parents go to a sinful extreme, and they do almost worship their child. And that's wrong, and it destroys the relationship. It certainly destroys the child, and it offends God. Because these are God's children, not yours. For you to treat them as if they were God is idolatry. But consider Our Lady's case. There is no need for her to worry about her attitude toward her infant son in this respect. It would be impossible for her to exaggerate her love for him. She is the only mother in the history of the world who could ever actually adore her child in the strict sense of the word and not commit the sin of idolatry. And yet, she's just an ordinary woman. No, she's not. It is not merely her maternal tenderness that shines in her eyes. It is no ordinary motherly love that glows in her heart. She has meditated attentively on the angel's message, upon the wonders told her by the shepherds, upon the mysteries that have taken place before her very eyes. And not only by her strong faith, but by a higher knowledge given to her, by her divine spouse, the Holy Ghost, by all of these special revelations, she recognizes and adores, in the strictest sense of the word, her child, as the most high God, but also as her own child. She looks upon the face of her child, and she sees the face of God. What a privilege it is. And it is a privilege. It isn't something that we earn by merit. It's not a reward for being good that we get to receive the same God that Mary held in her arms. The same God that she looked at in the stable. This God is ours and what's so remarkable about the religion that we belong to is, is that it's not just on Christmas Day that we get to do this. It's every single time we come to Mass. Every single Mass is a kind of Christmas for us. So Our Lady's adoration of Jesus began not at Christmas, but on March 25th, at the first moment of the dwelling in her womb. She alone, from all women ever created, was chosen for this. She was the purest of all creatures, worth more in the eyes of God than all the rest of the world. Now, whenever we want to approach another's infant or another's child, we usually do so with caution, because most likely we're going to be met with a cry or a scream until me and the child become used to each other. But how do we approach the infant God, even though he is most familiar with us? Well, we have to approach him by cleansing and purifying our heart from all sin, which is why the six of you were going to confession before your first Holy Communion. That is the proper way to prepare. And on the degree of purification that we attain depends the closeness that we are allowed to approach him. And to aid us in this matter, 
the church, a wise mother, knowing how important preparations are, gives us Advent, which ended just a few hours ago. Advent has the glorious purpose of helping us to become purified so that we can approach him in Holy Communion and then be able to receive the fullest amount of graces from our union. You three children today have not lived long enough to have what we call an affection for sin. That you may have committed venial sins, that's probably a given. But we adults, over the course of our long lives, we develop affections for venial sins and unfortunately maybe even for mortal sins. Your past is not one that's full of regrets. Not like the three that are sitting there. Not like the rest of us adults. We have great regrets. We have offended our good God, our creator, our savior. And with that in mind, the three of you adults, you may be feeling totally unworthy. Even though you've been baptized and have gone to confession, you still may be feeling very unworthy about approaching communion today after what has been said about our Lord and how pure we must be. But I would tell you this, if your past sinful life in youth is still worrying you, causing you to believe that nearness with the divine child won't be permitted, then I want you to follow the advice of St. John Eude, who taught that Jesus became a little child to sanctify all human childhood. He wasn't satisfied, St. John says, to become a man just for the love of man, an adult just for the love of adults, but also to become a child, subject to all the lowliness and weakness of infancy, in order to honor the Eternal Father in every condition of human life. In his own way, our Lord could have come into this world as an adult, he did not have to come in as a child. There must be a reason why he was born as a child. There was a precedent already set for him coming in as an adult because Adam and Eve were created as adults, not as babies. They didn't go through the progressive stages of growing into an adult. Our Lord became a child for a reason. And St. John Eude takes that reason and meditates on it. And he says, this is because we have to go through that process. And our youth sometimes is not very good. And so on Christmas Day, at our first communion, we offer him our own childhood. Even though it is long past, and we implore him most humbly when kneeling before the manger by virtue of his divine childhood to wipe out all that was bad or imperfect and to cause our whole life as a child to now make homage to his most adorable childhood. And then St. John says, tell our Lord in conclusion, no matter how bad my childhood has been, I will henceforth on this day, strive with the help of thy grace, which grace I beg for with my whole heart to become meek and humble and simple and pure and obedient, free of all arrogance, bitterness and malice, like a child, so that I may give some small honor to thy childhood, which so deserves to be honored. So with sentiments and resolutions such as these, be most confident that whenever is sung Venite Adoremus, O come let us adore him, 
during the Christmas time that you can go to and adore with Mary, her son, and not have any fear of being turned away. I know that we don't have this year a white Christmas, but as long as your soul is white and clean, what does it matter? That's all that counts on Christmas Day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.